Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. And thank you for being such a welcoming uh, community that I'm continually inspired by, um, not only on the basis of my actual physical visits that one time back in the past, uh, you know, back in the days of yore, uh, but also through following the wonderful YouTube channel of the San Francisco uh, Dharma Collective. And of course, is keeping in touch with the amazing classes that Eve and Chandra have both been teaching here. I think um, to so much benefit for everybody involved, because of course, this is not their first class. Uh, they've taught uh, many beautiful courses in the past, uh, in, in this same time slot, I believe. And then exploring the seven point mind training is such a rich and profound endeavor where we can all find so much material for our practice, our sitting practice, our day-to-day -day life, and the different types of uh, different ways to apply our emotional intelligence, essentially, and emotional balance in so many challenging situations, including the pandemic. And tonight, we're going to be talking uh, about the 50th slogan in the list that loosely forms the seventh point mind training as we know it. Um, most of you probably know that seven point mind training is actually not just one text that consists of those slogans. There's many different editions. And uh, in addition to the sort of the main text that was codified by Geshe Chekhova, there exist earlier versions that are um, similar in many ways, but include sometimes additional bits of advice. And these days, we can also find the same material taken apart to form, for example, a card deck, like the wonderful mind training card deck that uh, Pema Children uh, produced. But there's other ways like that as well. And because uh, every line sort of holographically contains all the other lines, uh, we can sometimes look at just one bit of advice from the seven points and see the rest of the seven points and the rest of the Dharma contained therein. And I think the slogan that we will be discussing today, do not be swayed by external circumstances or do not rely on outer circumstances. There's different translations of that. Actually encapsulates everything in the mind training very beautifully. And so we will attempt to explore a little bit of that and see how that relates to our daily life and to our current experiences in the world, being human and trying to stay humane in this very problematic environment. Uh, and I'm speaking very globally uh, here, a very uh, problematic world, troubled world that has so many divisions and uh, gives us so much challenge for our practice and our attempts to stay compassionate and wise. But before we go into this exploration, before we start um, listening, thinking, and then once again, meditating, I would invite all of us to uh, just do a little bit of sitting. So we will start with a sitting practice if you feel uh, like you want to join. And the practice will be very simple and probably very familiar to those who have practiced with Eve in the past or some of Eve's mentors, including Dr. Wallace or uh, Tenzin Wangil Rinpoche. And that practice is sometimes called settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states. Sometimes it is simply referred to as relaxing deeply. That's perfectly fine. Sometimes it's called the practice of three pills, stillness, silence, and spaciousness. But essentially what it refers to is that we temporarily release all activity, we temporarily release all motion, and we settle down in a profound experience of stillness and luminosity, stillness and the brightness of our awareness. And within that, by letting go more and more deeply, we try to experience the deeper levels of our own basic goodness. So in order to do that as a group, let's find a comfortable stationary position. It will be different for all of us because we have very different bodies. And so some people would choose to turn their cameras off and use the supine position or shavasana. Some people prefer, prefer a sitting position. Some others need um, their own option that would work best with our bodies. But in other case, it is something that is ideally stationary, that is, it supports stillness. And 
allows us to stay awake, promotes the quality of vigilance or certain mental clarity. And so the first thing to do is, as an act of compassion, adjust our position in a way that we ourselves see as best. If we are seated, perhaps relaxing and dropping our shoulders, making sure our spine is straight, resting our hands on our lap or on our knees or alongside our body if we are in the supine position of Shavasana right now. Our lips are gently touching without any tension around our mouth. The tip of the tongue just gently resting behind our upper teeth. And our awareness, our variability to recognize, to be conscious of, is in this moment resting in the body. We're allowing our awareness to descend into the body. And for that, sometimes it's even helpful to imagine our awareness going down along the spine as if in a tiny elevator until it reaches the navel area. And then expands throughout our entire body, noticing the different tactile experiences there. For a little while, we will just rest in this area deep in our body, observing the tactile sensations in our feet, throughout our legs, in our abdominal area. And in this way, grounding ourselves deeply. Noticing the fluctuations of these sensations in the lower part of our body. And eventually above the navel area, throughout our chest, in our hands and fingers, and in our face. And as we observe these movements, these tactile changes, as we release all deliberate physical activity, coming in contact with the quality of stillness. The stillness beyond and behind all movement. With each natural outbreath, we release all intentional movement. And our awareness is noticing not only the movement, but also the stillness.
our speech is inactive in this moment. We're not saying anything. And likewise, we can gradually release all the mental chatter, the mental narrative, the inner dialogue or narration. And although there are several different ways of doing that, one of the most simple is to attend to our physical sensations, especially those associated with the breath, with greater and greater stability. more and more mindfully with recollection. And so anytime we notice that our inner dialogue occurs once again, that there is a narration, we simply release that into silence. Relaxing deeply into that silence and being aware of the silence. And then likewise for our mind, Releasing all deliberate mental activity, such as analysis, planning, remembering the past. Settling down in the quality of spaciousness, where the mind is clear, but it is not fused with any of the mental appearances. Instead, simply releasing them or staying inert. It's as if instead of looking at the furniture of the mind and everything that fills the mind, we're resting with the space, the space itself. No interest in the contents, just an uninterrupted flow of clarity and awareness. And so we'll rest in this still and silent spaciousness for two more minutes. Anytime we notice any restlessness or any attempts to analyze or move, really, we just release them with the out breath and continue simply being.
And then and out of that spaciousness for a very short while, generating thoughts, but very deliberately. The thoughts about our aspirations and our motivation for this class and the sit that we're having together. Coming back to our own highest aspirations that have to do with our spirituality or our psychological growth. And although those aspirations are very personal, as they should be, one thing we can do together is strengthen them in this moment so that there is some intentionality behind this class. And also making our individual aspirations, our motivation more expansive by aspiring for a greater benefit for all beings, not just ourselves. So if I aim, if I am able to liberate my own mind, others also find greater happiness through that. And on a more immediate note, making sure that throughout this class, we're gentle with ourselves and with the other participants. Already bringing quality of loving kindness to everything that we do. So with that as our, as our motivation, coming back to our body just for a little while, just to ground ourselves once again. And then if we wish, slowly wiggling our toes and fingers, maybe rocking back and forth a little bit to bring movement back into the body. And then concluding the meditation to rejoin each other in this shared online space. Thank you for joining me in this practice. Um, I hope for those of you who have just had a very full day, this provided a little bit of a temporary respite and um, a moment to perhaps rest in the deeper levels of our awareness. This practice actually has a lot to do with, of course, uh, our topic for tonight because uh, and actually with the rest of the seven points, uh, you might remember that one of the earlier slogans, one of the earlier points has to do with resting in the nature of alaya or resting in the nature of the ground of all. And although that slogan has several different interpretations with regards to what exactly is meant by that ground of all, the practice that we just did uh, has a direct connection to that. It's the practice of settling our body our speech and our mind in naturalness. And so naturalness does not mean that everything else we do is unnatural. Oh, so it's unnatural to move and think and eat and you know, uh, fight for what's right and read books and walk around. It's only natural to sit down and close your eyes. That's not the implication here. But what's implied is that there is a deeper level to everything that we are and our temporary uh, arising, temporarily arising person, this person that in my case, for example, can be validly called Lopsang or Tenpa or Lopsang Tenpa, can be referred to by using he, they, pronouns and so forth. This temporarily arising person is sort of like a bubble formed on a stream. And this bubble does exist. You can observe it in a way you can hear it uh, as I speak. You can refer to it. You can have different opinions about it and so forth. But eventually this bubble bursts and then there's just the water that's flowing underneath uh, and that existed throughout the existence of that bubble as its nature. So in this theory that the Tibetan tradition has so beautifully uh, preserved and transmitted, uh, the grosser levels of what we are go with our roots in terms of their roots go into the deeper levels. And so this gross level of who I am and all the activity that I undertake, which in many cases is neurotic 
because I'm a deluded being, I can allow it to temporarily melt into this deeper awareness and then melt ever deeper and deeper and deeper until I access a very foundational level, which is referred to as basic goodness or Buddha nature or primordial wisdom or pristine awareness and so forth and many names for it. And so when this practice is done to much uh, fuller extent, when it's done very elaborately and for many, many, many hours, it actually allows practitioners to go very deeply into their basic goodness. But even when we do it just as a 15 minute exercise, 10 minute exercise, 20 minute exercise, if we are able to at least temporarily release all activity, we are coming in touch with that basic goodness, which becomes a source of resources, uh, uh, no pun intended, it becomes an incredible source of resilience for us if we're able to just relax into it. So of course, that's a helpful skill to have when we're engaged, when any sort of uh, endeavors, including intellectual or creative work. And many people use this practice as a creativity exercise. It's actually very good to, if we know that we're tackling a problem, but the creative solution is just not arising, to think a little bit about the problem that we're dealing with and then release it, do a practice similar to this one or just this very practice of settling body, speech, and mind. And not thinking about the problem itself, just rest in that naturalness until a solution emerges from the depth of our mind. I know many people have done that, including Alan Wallace, but not, certainly not limited to. Many people who have used that to successfully deal with physics problems, creative problems, you know, organizational problems and so forth. Just because the deeper levels of our basic goodness have many more answers than our conscious mind often does. And so being able to tap into that more deep, into that deeper level um, has a profound connection with the slogan for tonight. The slogan that reads in uh, the basic translation that we're using here, don't be swayed by external circumstances. And we'll look at the other translation, the alternative translation as well. But when we talk about don't be swayed by external, external circumstances here, of course, um, an obvious thing here is that we can read it as a general advice for life, for how we're supposed to lead our life. And it's in general a good grandmotherly, grandfatherly, ancestral advice to say, yeah, don't be swayed by external circumstances. Hold truth to who you are, to what you believe in, your values stick to your values and don't let you know your friends just to influence you or don't allow peer pressure to force you into things that you would not like to be doing and so forth so that's one level of course uh, but that would probably be the interpretation that we would resort to resort to if we took the slogan completely outside of the context of the seven points of mind training because when we read uh, the way this specific slogan is interpreted in classic commentaries, and there's many of those and some contemporary ones as well, we would see that in many cases, it is very, it is almost all, always connected to the seven point mind training as a whole, as a whole system of practice. And then it means in your mind training practice, don't be swayed by external circumstances. circumstances. So not just in general, not just in general, hold truth to who you are, Specifically, when you're training your mind in altruism and wisdom, or in the conventional and ultimate bodhicitta, uh, it, when you're training your mind on the path to awakening, in that respect, in that regard, in that context, don't be swayed by external circumstances. That's one of the major interpretations that are given. And uh, at the same time, I think there is still value in coming back to that more general advice, just don't be swayed by external circumstances, period. You know, regardless of mind training or not mind training, hold truth to what you believe in. Although, of course, there is then the caveat of actually checking our beliefs and seeing if they are in line with the reality. Because just saying, hey, this is what I believe in. And, you know, uh, causes don't lead to conditions. My behavior doesn't influence the uh, experiences of others. I can do whatever I want. Nothing I do affects others. No, those kinds of beliefs. When we check them against reality, we see that it would have been wise of us to listen to the feedback we were getting from others, but we did not. So of course, it doesn't mean that. 
but keeping if we are still practicing common sense and common sense in this respect means being in line with a natural of interdependence then we can validly hold truth hold true to what we ourselves see as valuable uh, beneficial and right and in that respect uh, the buddha uh, famously compared the path of the dharma in, in general the path of spiritual transformation or mental transformation to swimming against the stream, which is a metaphor probably very well familiar to many of you. Streaming, uh, swimming against the stream of mundane influence, of so many sources of influence that uh, in general tell us to do many things that are not so beneficial, including abandoning our mental training to pursue only the hedonic well-being to the detriment of our inner or eudaimonic growth. And so it is in this case that I um, think of another aphorism uh, or another slogan, which is the famous last testament of a very illustrious yogi of the 20th century, Kenpo Jigme Punsok, who was not only the founder of a very, very famous monastic town, essentially, in eastern Tibet, but also one of the gurus of the current Dalai Lama, uh, one of the great teachers for whom Alan Wallace had the fortune of translating in uh, the United States. Uh, and a very, very accomplished practitioner. Kenpo Jigme Punsok made sure to uh, recreate uh, yogic and monastic practice in Eastern Tibet after the very, very uh, difficult decades of the Cultural Revolution, but also was known for his yogic achievements. So very, very accomplished meditator. And um, an advice, a bit of advice that he gave uh, right before his passing has just two phrases in it, two lines which are sort of a slightly more expanded version of the 50th slogan, the slogan that we're looking at. And it says, do not lose your own path. Do not disturb the minds of others. That's kind of the best life advice that he could give. Do not lose your own path and do not disturb the minds of others. So if you, you know, the kind of situation where you imagine, uh, like Alan Wallace did when he was young, he uh, famously said many times, and I, uh, to translate for him in some of those cases, that when he was younger and he was about 20, he was living in Germany and uh, he thought about going to Asia, uh, specifically to Nepal, to climb the mountain and find a hidden cave. And in that cave, there would be an old man sitting, an old yogi practitioner. And that old yogi practitioner would say, hey, Alan, hey, welcome in. I've been waiting for you for all these years. You're the perfect student that I've always wanted to get. And now I'm going to transmit my wisdom to you. And that would be that. And that's the fulfillment of your life purposes. And nothing happened exactly like that. It was a very utopian dream. But we can imagine ourselves in a situation where we are faced with a great yogini or a great yogi, you know, a great yogi practitioner who, after all their practice, would give us just one bit of advice that uh, we would then carry in our hearts and practice with and, and you know, a few decades also attain the highest awakening in the very same manner. And so in this case, that's exactly what happened. Ken Pujigme Punsok said, well, that's, that's, that's the advice. That's the thing I'm telling you to do. I can't give you uh, this whole seven point mind training because I'm dying. So I'm just gonna say two lines. And the two lines are, do not lose your own path. Do not disturb the minds of others. And do not lose your own path not does not just pertain to our path as in like our path through this life or in this life. You know, it's not just about circumstances where as a part of my path, I love Sangtenpa, was first studying there and then I became a monastic and then I translated here and then I moved and traveled and la di da. Well, that's valuable, but it's not like I can really lose it. Uh, you know, because things just happen. So things arise in succession, circumstances change, I'm invited here, there, and I have to go do this. So it's like, it's not like I can lose the sequence of causes and conditions. It pertains much, uh, much more immediately to my mind and me not losing the path of mental training or the path of eudaimonic well-being that I'm pursuing. So I'm not in a danger of losing my own path in terms of like moving here and there or doing this job and then that job and translating this book and so forth. I am, however, in danger constantly of letting go of my practice if I choose to or actually if I fall prey to my mental afflictions. You know, my laziness being first, uh, probably the most immediate cause for me abandoning my practice in many cases. So if I'm like, 
Yeah, I'm very tired tonight. I think I'll skip on this tiny bit of practice that I do every night. And then in the morning, oh, I'm still sleepy. You know, I feel so broken. I feel so tired. I'm also not going to do my morning practice. And then throughout the day, I'm just like, I can't get out of bed. I'll just watch Netflix and it chips or something like that. And then it goes on and on and on and on like that. And, you know, it's been three years and I haven't meditated once. And then I'm kind of still around the Dharma, but I can't say that I'm really practicing. So in that case, yes, I have lost my own path. I've lost the path of my practice. I lost my internal path. And uh, that's awkward for everybody involved because, of course, the more I practice, and not just like in terms of having many hours of sitting meditation, but the more I train my mind in big and small ways, the better I am able to show up for others, including everybody present here. And uh, that's true for all of us. The more effort we apply in uh, the seven point mind training or any kind of mind training in our Dharma practice in general, the better we are able to show up for each other and for the world. And then for the planet that is in a very, very problematic state. And then for the society and then for so many communities that's been marginalized and desperately need us to stand up for what's right and so forth. You know, So not losing my own path, including very crucially, all the mind training that I'm doing. And then not disturbing the minds of others equally, which in this case simply means continually practicing compassion with others. So it doesn't mean that I should not challenge the status quo or say something that might potentially upset, you know, powers that be or, you know, the capitalist worldview and so forth. That would be ridiculous because Buddha said many things that disturb the minds of others very famously, including challenging the case system and so forth. Uh, ordaining female monastics, like many things that he did, including upsetting his father by leaving the palace in the first place. Uh, so th that is true. That is valid. We need to be doing many of those things. But this pertains to not disturbing the minds of others out of our afflictions. Just because our mind is in a disturbed, afflicted, deluded state, and we blurt out whatever, or we actually say things that are deeply humble out, harmful out of a malicious intent, or following our greed, or because we're deeply ignorant about the way people should be addressed and treated. That's called the disturb, that's disturbing the minds of others. But why do we disturb the minds of others? Under the influence of our afflictions, with no beneficial motivation or anything in sight. And so part of our path that we're trying not to lose is continually checking our motivations, is continually making sure that our compassion is strongly present. And then on the basis of that compassion, not disturbing the minds of others, unless that's absolutely required in terms of compassionate service and in terms of being of benefit to others. So the title, the overarching uh, slogan that we have here, do not be swayed by external circumstances, sort of conveys both of these ideas. It is both about not losing our practice just because outer circumstances, including being tired, actually, uh, because we have a job or we have so many commitments and so forth, or because the weather is not right, or we're surrounded by a very problematic health situation, you know, not being swayed by that and also not being swayed by all the negative influences that our mind can receive when we're consuming information from the outside. But then, of course, when we say don't be swayed by external circumstances, if we simply think that means not being emotionally swayed at all, that's a very, very high level of practice that we're thinking of then. Because not being at all emotionally disturbed when something on the outside level happens, including loss, different challenges, being attacked by others, you know, having a, a bad reputation and so forth, those are all big things that cause a strong emotional reaction. Learning that um, one of your friends has not been fully honest with you about something that is important or losing your livelihood. So many things, you know, very emotionally impactful. So if the slogan was just about that, it would be as if uh, Atisha and then uh, Geshe Chekawa, the authors of this mind training system, were just telling us, you know, if you're depressed, don't be depressed. And if you're worried, don't be worried. You know, and if you're anxious, just don't be anxious. And it's all going to be cool. You know, it's going to work out. Just don't be anxious. 
And of course, that's not what they're doing because that would be ridiculous. It's not like, oh, you're afflicted. You know, don't be afflicted. Your mind is deluded. Well, snap out of it. You know, it's not like that. It's specifically, as we have discussed, about not losing our practice, not being swayed in our practice, not in terms of our emotions, but in terms of the commitment to the practice that we have. And uh, in the Japanese Purlin tradition, there is a very beautiful metaphor. Um, it is present in many of the poems translated by D.T. Suzuki, uh, who was um, famously not only writing about the Zen tradition, uh, where he made incredible contribution, but also about a Pure Land tradition, which he often uh, saw as a counterbalance to the simplicity and the directness of Zen. And so in the Pure Land tradition, there's a um, number of practitioners who were famous for being very, very simple, uh, very, very down to earth, and uh, very, very elegant in terms of their devotion to the Buddha of infinite light, which is sort of the heart of the Pure Land tradition. And one of them, uh, famously in a short poem, and many of them wrote very simple poems about their practice, uh, compared his practice to a red thread that connects him to the Buddha of infinite light. And he said, I hold on to Amitabha's name, to Buddha of infinite light's name, as if holding on to a red thread that will guide me through everything. And so I think regardless of whether there, we feel any uh, connection to the Pure Land tradition uh, or Japanese Buddhism uh, or any other Dharmic tradition, really, comparing our practice to a thread that we are holding on to as we're following our very, very complicated path through life is actually a helpful metaphor. No matter what happens in my life, that's how I'm thinking to myself then. No matter what happens, no matter what challenges arise tomorrow, no matter, how, no matter how many difficult situations I would face, and I will face some difficult situation, that's inevitable. You know, no matter what happens in terms of my, eventually my sickness, old age and death, my practice is this red thread, golden thread. You can choose a color that you feel most connected to. That's sometimes specified in the Pure Land tradition text. You know, sometimes in some texts they say, and here you have to imagine a lotus. But don't worry, it can be any color that you like. You can imagine it as yellow or white or green. I think that's very, very sweet, sweet. So in this case as well, like it can be any kind of thread that you feel most inspired by. But the important idea is that it's something to hold on to as we're navigating life. And that is in general mind training practice as a whole, but also any sort of elements of mind training that we especially find helpful for ourselves. Maybe it's compassion practice, maybe it's wisdom practice, maybe it's both, maybe it's uh, something else. And eventually we accumulate this whole mandala of methods that work together in beautiful symphony. Uh, and all of them together are just that one thread. So in some cases, it's helpful to imagine that we have this whole support structure that surrounds us, like a mandala. A mandala literally means circle, simply circle. So we are surrounded by the circle of support. And in some cases, instead of seeing a whole circle around us, because that's not always believable when we are at our lowest, we at least know that we have this one thread to hold on to. And even if it's something simple, and in Tibetan tradition, for many people, that thread was just reciting the mantra of Om Mani Padme Hum, like, because they didn't know any other practices necessarily, not even prayers, they were illiterate. But just holding on to that and navigating life, showing up with a lot of grace, compassion, and wisdom, or at least being willing to cultivate compassion, grace, and wisdom. So that's definitely one way of seeing it. No matter what happens, no matter how many outer circumstances arise as obstacles, I will not be swayed, not emotionally. Emotionally, I will continue to react until I'm a very, very advanced being. I'm not there yet at all but I will not be swayed in terms of holding on to the thread of my practice, whatever that practice is for me. And in the Tibetan tradition, it's uh, like a cultural note that would be familiar to many of you. In the Tibetan tradition, practice is often built around so-called commitments. Uh, and a commitment means that if you have, for example, been engaged in Tibetan Buddhist practice for a while and you've interacted with uh, certain teachers, eventually you receive different kinds of transmissions and different permissions to the specific practices. And when you do receive those transmissions or permissions or empowerments, there's different names for all this kind of stuff. Uh, with that comes a commitment where your teacher uh, would say, 
And now you have to recite this mantra daily or do this meditation or recite this text or meditate on that. And so, for example, some of my teachers, including the great, great Yogi Garchan Rinpoche, who currently lives in Arizona, they say, well, the commitment for any of the empowerments that I, hear, that I give is to continually cultivate your love and compassion. That's the quintessential commitment for all practices. And that's not the only opinion. There are many other types of commitments. But receiving that and then honoring that daily by knowing, hey, well, I've committed to this. I will not skip my love and compassion practice because it's better to uh, do it than not to do it. And it's better to still show up even if it's difficult and I'm tired and lazy and so forth, but to do it at least a tiny bit. And through holding on to that, keep making those tiny, tiny steps, one step at a time, knowing that when I will look back in 10 years or 20 years of practice, or in some cases, even six months, I will see a radical improvement in terms of how loving and compassionate I am. So holding on to those commitments as our thread and not being swayed in that, and of course, holding on to the ideals that are at the root of mind training. And those ideals, ideals usually boil down to wisdom and compassion, those two quintessential moments two quintessential elements. And so that's one interpretation of it, you know, one translation of do not lose your own path uh, or and do not disturb the minds of others, quintessentialized, quintessentialized as don't be swayed by external circumstances. Whatever happens, don't let go of your practice. And then in addition to that, we know that there is a way of transforming all of our circumstances into practice and there's actually a number of ways like that, some of which have been covered by Eve and Chandra in the previous installments in this series. Uh, Seven Points Mind Training have a lot of methods for transforming problems into the path, transforming felicity into the path, uh, so joyful situations, essentially, and transforming neutral situations into the path. So there are some recipes for that, even in the Seven Point Mind Training, and even if you uh, were not present when even Chandra were explaining those in any commentary on this system, whether contemporary, like the commentaries by Pema Chodron, Alan Wallace, Karan Dalai Lama, there are several like that, uh, or traditional commentaries, there are many written in, in previous centuries, you would see an explanation, explanation for this point. But another very familiar, perhaps, uh, system, especially close and beloved, uh, to those who have some, pra some practice experience in the Theravada tradition uh, or its derivative, the inside tradition, is seeing how the four immeasurables or uh, the four types of kindness correlate to all the experiences that we have in life. And in this logic, everything that we experience is of the th three categories. It's either pleasant situation or an unpleasant situation or sort of a neutral situation. So it's very simple, very, very elegant. And of course, nothing is as simple as that because all situations might have a negative undertone underneath them if they're sort of generally pleasant or they might be unpleasant, but there is something good happening. So there's of course that nuance, but overall we can say at any point, well, is this a pleasant thing for you? Or is this a joyful thing for you? like gathering together, you know, what's predominant in your mind? Is it more pleasant or more unpleasant? A sort of neither here nor there. And at any moment, actually, from the technical uh, point of uh, view point, we can see that in our mind, one of the three feelings would predominate. And then on the basis of that, the advice that's given when the four measurables are taught, the four types of kindness, is that in any situation that is pleasant, and uh, we can all hope that there will be more and more joy in our lives, um, internal inner joy, eudaimonic joy, and of course, outer joy stemming from having prosperity and so forth. Whenever joy arises, we can strengthen it by using empathetic joy or sympathetic joy, one of the four immeasurables, a joy that is joyful about being joyful, you know, with regards to our own joy and the joys of others. And so when I see some of you smiling and hopefully being a little bit happy about being in this Dharma space, then I can practice that and being uh, by thinking, wow, how wonderful, how amazing. May this joy grow. And then that's my response to your happiness, to my own happiness, 
it transforms this happiness, your happiness and my happiness into the Dharma, into pra practice of Dharma. So then when I see some of you being unhappy, maybe you're looking at me with sadness and you're thinking, well, when is this going to end? You know, let's go back to meditation or let's, let's stop the class. I can't take any of this anymore. You know, there is obviously some suffering. Maybe somebody has a headache uh, from me speaking. Uh, you never know. But then seeing some suffering in ourselves and in each other and responding with compassion, of course. Compassion as in a very specific mind state that says, uh, may you be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And so using any unpleasant situation then as a foundation for our practice of Dharma. And then, of course, some situations are sort of neutral. Maybe I'm walking the street, I'm going to buy bread. And it's not particularly joyful. It's not particularly unpleasant. It's just kind of meh on the spectrum of pleasant and unpleasant. It's a neutral situation. But then, of course, the system of the four immeasurables says that's the perfect opportunity to practice loving kindness because loving kindness aspires for happiness. And in this situation, this neutral situation, it sees that greater happiness is possible. So I'm sort of in this space where I'm like neither here nor there. And maybe I'm like in this class, maybe I'm feeling rather indifferent about um, lops and tempo raving on and on and on. Well, then I can wish for greater happiness for all of us. May we all have greater joy. May we attain greater happiness. May greater happiness happen for all beings, not just us, of course, but everybody who is out there in the world desperately wishing for greater happiness. And then, of course, in that case, a neutral, sort of neutral, relatively neutral situation becomes the foundation for my practice. And if I remember this simple approach or any of the other approaches, including those in, uh, taught in the seven points, then I know that nothing can sway me eventually when I'm becoming very, very deeply familiar with this system. Why? Because there's no fourth kind of situation. It's all pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And these can change in quick succession, sure. There's no fourth potential category. And so there's no category that would not be a suitable basis for me practicing. And there's also no situation where I just don't have the mental, um, I just don't have enough resources to practice the four measurables in terms of outside resources. I need to have like certain composure and I need to be rested to meditate formally. Yes, there is a great need for self-care. But in terms of at least being able to generate a passing thought of compassion when I'm suffering, I need very little. And so I can recall instances in my life when I was experiencing very strong physical pain uh, from food poisoning, from trauma and so forth. And knowing that because of my previous habituation to mind training practices, even though I wasn't able to meditate deeply, you know, or even recite prayers and practices and all that thing that uh, we as Tibetan Buddhists love, I was still able to use a very quintessential method, which is very, uh, very important in the Tibetan tradition. And that is when I'm in pain, being able to think through this pain, may nobody else experience pain. Through my suffering, may the suffering of others be completely exhausted. Uh, or equally, well, I'm really joyful because everything's going well and I'm surrounded by friends and it's bloody da, you know, a Dharma feast and everybody's joyful and happy and radiant and enlightened and beautiful being able to say, well, may all beings partake of this feast of joy. You know, may all beings share in this joy. May, they, may their joy grow to the same degree and more until we're all fully awakened and then we're just all blissing out in enlightenment, you know, that sort of thing. So even when I'm not able to do formal practice, even though formal practice is important, at least being able to generate those passing thoughts without being swayed by external circumstances. And so that's why the second translation, the alternative translation for this slogan, which is equally used in some of the English language commentaries and some of the translated commentaries is, don't be dependent on other conditions. It's not referring to not being dependent on other conditions in terms of our food, for example, because we are dependent on each other. And thinking about the networks of interdependence is important. And it's not about not being dependent on others for friendship, you know, or healthcare, and so many other things, which are all based on interdependence, interconnectivity, gratitude for each other, and so forth. So it's not about that. 
but don't be dependent on other conditions in terms of thinking, I need this for my practice, otherwise I can't practice. And I think we all know that from other areas of our life. I have some friends who have been saying, oh, I can't jog until I buy these very special shoes, jogging shoes, you know, that sort of thing. And I think we all do that in different areas of life. Oh, I can't paint until I buy these very special albums and this very special paper. Like I can't practice or I can't do this until I have the perfect hour conditions for that. And because perfection doesn't exist in the outer world, we're always putting it off in a way. So this slogan then, don't be dependent on other conditions, admonishes us to avoid putting off our practice because we think, if only I have this special outside environment, then I can do Dharma practice. Otherwise, I just can't. Maybe one day I'll go into the forests of Northern or Southern California, or maybe to Oregon, or maybe to Washington State. Maybe actually I'll go to Asia or somewhere in Europe. Maybe I hear Iceland is good, you know, and then I'll do meditation, then I'll do retreat, and it will be beautiful. And I'll cultivate all these amazing mental states. I'll take all the recordings from even Chandra and I'll listen to them all day, and I'll just do whale watching, and my mind will open up like a flower. And in that flower, there'll be the jewel of awakening. And it will be, everything will be like in the mantra of Mani Padme Hum, the jewel and the lotus. So probably not. You know, it might happen. I really sincerely wish that all of you present, including myself, were all able to do beautiful retreats like that, where everything is just exhilarating to the mind and everything is so beautiful and pristine. But if we wait, if we put off our practice until that happens, we will have to wait for a long, long time, you know, unless you're a billionaire, in which case it can happen for you right now. Uh, in which case, good on you, mate. You know, otherwise, uh, probably trying to practice right here and, and right now in whatever way we can, not putting off our practice. But then in a certain way, also in contemplating that, knowing that some, in some cases, what happens is that we do our best in Dharma practice. We do our best in life in general, and we also do practice and we're maybe even in Dharma spaces and then disappointments happen, like major disappointments that really throw us off. And uh, in some cases that happens with Dharma communities where we've all gathered here to practice Dharma and then there's just this bickering or something like that, you know, this arguing, there's so many emotional conflicts or some foul play or a scandal, or something emerges, or just our practice is not going as well as it should. I'm meditating, but I'm not progressing. Uh, or I'm meditating, but my mind is just so restless. So we face these disappointments, which of course, of course, come from causes and conditions, but then being able to say, hey, all of that is still, even when it refers to our meditation, and our meditation not going as smoothly as we want it to, that's still sort of other conditions. Why is it other conditions? Well, it's still a condition other than my mind training itself. And so if I cannot even rely on expecting my meditation experiences to unfold just like in that, in that perfect order. I cannot expect that a Dharma community will not have some upheavals and some arguments from within. I cannot expect the country to be perfect, any country whatsoever. Uh, I cannot expect my family to be perfect and not to never you know, disappoint me in any way. But when I can do, when those challenges happen, is to come back to the thread of mind training, place my hand upon my chest, which is a very famous trick from the self-compassion practice taught by Kristen Neff, based on tr more traditional sources. Placing my, heart, my hand upon my neck, oh, sorry, upon my heart, noticing that this is a moment of suffering and then being able to say, May I be gentle with myself in this moment. May I be well. May I be kind to myself in this challenging moment. That in itself is mind training. That is in itself is a part of this mind training system. Start with yourself. That's one of the slogans. And so being able to be gentle with myself, I then readjust my whole mind-body complex in a way where I realize, okay, this is a challenge. This was disappointing. This is still an other condition. And I don't need to depend on that. And I don't need to be swayed by that. I can return to the center, to the ground, to the natural state. And in doing that, I can recalibrate 
my experiences. One additional note there, and I'm just going to mention it before we do a very, very brief meditation, and then we'll open up for your comments and thoughts. One additional thing that I find very helpful in practicing this slogan is relying on examples of the past, the great role models of the past. I think that is actually very quintessential. Uh, in general, um, I actually mentioned that last time I was uh, in SFDC in my physical form, as opposed to my Zoom emanation. But um, I think it's very important, and many Buddhist communities have started embracing that across the United States, that we think of ancestry and ancestors. Uh, and that includes three different kinds of ancestors, at least in my understanding. One is our lineage ancestors. So that's our Dharma lineage. And in the Tibetan tradition, we have these long prayers where we list all the masters of a certain transmission, uh, of a certain practice. So we have these lists of names that go all the way back to the Buddha, go through all, all the Indian masters and all the Tibetan masters and up to this present day and age. Uh, and they conclude with people like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama and so forth, which are people we are immediately in touch with in a way, in a manner of speaking. So that's our Dharma ancestors. And of course, each lineage, each tradition has many different Dharma uh, ancestors like that, whose examples we rely on and whose presence and blessing we can feel in one way or another. But in addition to that, we have our land ancestors. And that's us thinking back to the people who have originally inhabited this land. And in some cases, before it was occupied, you know, in case we are, if we are on unceded land, uh, or in some cases, if our sort of tribe is the original tribe that always lived in this land, people are living all over the globe. And in some cases, that is uh, what it is. Then thinking about all the previous generations of people who have lived on this land and were the caretakers of this land, you know, there's that. And so in this case, that's where uh, paying homage to the original landowners or custodians of the land becomes so important and valuable. And then the third category is, of course, our blood, blood ancestors. So our grandmothers, grandfathers, and all the way back, you know, to Adam and Eve, and Adam and Steve, uh, and everybody else that we can think of all the way back to the ancient, ancient past, where we know they face so many struggles. You know, we have toilets, they did not, you know, with running water, you know, we have, in some cases, they have lived through such events as Holocaust and so forth, so many unimaginable types of suffering, and they survived. Not only did they survive, many of them, in many cases, um, attained greater levels of compassion and very, very foundational human wisdom. So, you know, all that wisdom and paying homage to that and knowing, hey, my grandmothers and my grand grandmothers and my grand 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 grandmothers, they've dealt with life, they've dealt with similar challenges, and they've managed to maintain their compassion and their wisdom. Maybe, maybe not at the level of a Buddha, but certainly to a very large degree in incredible amounts. Thinking of that also fills us with inspiration for holding our ground, not being dependent on other conditions, not being swayed by external circumstances circumstances, not losing our own path. And so I think sometimes one of the beauties of the Tibetan tradition and its methods is that there's a lot of practices for tapping into that uh, inspiring influence. And that's the kind of short meditation I would invite you now to do with me before we open it up. So if you would like to do it, please feel free to, first of all, move about a little bit, uh, just to make sure the body feels comfortable if you need to stand up, please stand up. If you need to move around, move around. But then eventually finding a comfortable stationary position where we will be able to go into our sources of inspiration and influence for a very short while. And so returning to whichever position we feel is best for us right now. Maybe supine, maybe sitting, maybe something in between, whatever our body requires, but ideally something that is both relaxed and vigilant, that supports both clarity and relaxation.
And in that, without trying to do a body scan or anything like that, we've already done that in the previous session of meditation, just going straight into the quality of physical stillness. Sitting there, breathing naturally, and releasing all physical tension and all physical movement with each out breath. Same with the silence of the speech, releasing our mental narration for the time being while noticing our breath. And on the level of our mind, just temporarily releasing thoughts of the past or the future. We will use thinking in the practice itself in a controlled manner, but for now we are able to just rest in spaciousness. Just staying awake without engaging in any sort of mental appearances. And then recalling our own personal aspirations for meditation in general, perhaps for this class as well, by literally thinking, I'm doing this practice in order to, and then expressing our own aspirations mentally. And then with our body, speech, and mind resting and relaxing ever more deeply with each out breath, we use our conceptual thinking and our creative abilities to recall a person that for us in our life, in our lifetime, has been an example of resilience and inner strength. It can be one of our parents or grandparents or one of our mentors or a famous person that we know about. Someone who has shown inner strength, kindness, moral integrity and resilience in the face of suffering. Regardless of whether that suffering seemed dramatic or not from the outside. Just thinking of someone who is an example of resilience and inner strength and imagining this person in front of us. Doesn't matter if our visualization is clear or not. The point is simply thinking of this person. And in seeing them in front of us, we are trying to recognize one of one or two other positive qualities that supported their resilience or were stemming out of that resilience. Maybe this person is truly kind or wise or generous or patient, anything. Recognizing one or two or three qualities in addition to resilience that we really think of as admirable.
And then flipping our awareness to realize whatever these positive qualities are, I also have these qualities to a certain degree. And the fact that I'm finding them admirable means that I can be inspired by these qualities in this person. And through that, cultivate my own mind, my own basic goodness. And so we're imagining that the inspiration of and the inspiring power of these qualities comes forth from the person in front of us as warm golden light that is like the nourishing rays of the sun. Entering our own body, speech, and mind to inspire the same qualities in us. Kindness inspiring kindness, wisdom inspiring wisdom, and so forth. And all of that strengthening our own resilience our perseverance, our determination to be practitioners of mind training. Just imagining the, this inspiring flow, which of course, ideally, would be coming not just from this one person, but from all of our noble ancestors of different kinds. And then also imagining that these same qualities can be shared by us. And so now from our own side, the same golden light, the same warm sun-like nature streams towards all the other beings. First, the other practitioners in this class, for we can be a source of inspiration for them. And then for everybody else in our life, and then eventually throughout the world. Our kindness will always inspire greater kindness throughout the world. And then the same with all the other positive qualities. And so in not losing our own path, we'll be able to not only avoid disturbing the minds of others, but also inspire the minds of others for many years to come. As we release this visualization, we very briefly come back to our body to anchor ourselves by observing the breath and the physical sensations still, silent, and spacious. And then when we feel ready, wiggling our fingers and toes, rocking back and forth perhaps, and then slowly ending this meditation. Thank you. And um, since I don't have anything else meaningful to say, I think it's the perfect time to open it up for a little while to see if there are any ideas or any personal experiences with regards to either not being swayed by external circumstances or not relying on outer circumstances in terms of our practice. So anything that you felt connected to or anything that came to your mind uh, please feel free to uh, share. Uh, and I think we can all learn from each other in that respect.
Uh, there's a question here in the chat. Um, what do you recommend when it's hard to meditate because our mind is restless? Wow. Well, um, there's so much stuff, you know, there's so many ideas. And uh, at the same time, none of them are an easy solution. So, uh, of course, uh, I'm not like Eve in that I am much, my familiarity with the latest research on the topic is much more humble than hers. Eve is just a walking source of infinite knowledge when it comes to the connection between our minds, our emotions, our brains, and our bodies. But I can give some of the traditional bits of advice uh, and uh, coming from my training in the Tibetan lineage. And one wonderful advice that I received uh, is that um, we have to remember that meditation is just not one thing. You know, meditation is not just sitting concentration practice. Uh, and meditation is also not just plain mindfulness as in like being mindful of brushing our teeth and being mindful of walking and being mindful of eating chocolate. Those are the two main varieties of meditation that are familiar uh, uh, to Westerners, to us as Westerners. And they're heavily promoted by the popular mindfulness movement, which brings a lot of benefit. But there's so much more to meditation as a field uh, or as an area of human knowledge. And uh, there are chanting practices, there are movement practices, there are practices of reciting prayers, there are practices of reciting sacred texts and so forth. And there is now a big dialogue um, um, part of which is the wonderful book by Cheng Xing Han, uh, Be the Refuge. Uh, there's a large dialogue about how reducing mindfulness to, uh, sorry, reducing meditation to just mindfulness and closing our eyes and concentrating and so forth uh, is in many ways not only colonial, and it is deeply colonial, uh, but it is also um, uh, essentially um, removing the uh, our ability to use these other types of practices when we are too restless to meditate, you know. And so, some of my teachers who have been brought up in the West but trained with Tibetan lamas, when their mind is too restless, they do practices where they recite mantras or prayers. And it doesn't have to be some, you know, holy ritual something if that's not your thing. The mantras can be recited just because they calm down the mind. You know, prayers and aspirations can be prayers about the benefit of humanity and the planet being preserved. So it doesn't have to be all holy, holy, but these other types of practices help the mind to calm down. And in terms of uh, so trying to settle the mind, body, speech, and mind in the natural states, that's the second part of this question. Uh, in some cases, actually, this practice would be in a traditional setting uh, preceded by a little bit of chanting. Or in our case, we can also think, well, maybe I can precede this practice with a little bit of movement or a little bit of breath work, depending on what works for you and what modalities you are familiar with. Uh, and it can be preceded you know, by a luxurious bath or something like that, depending once again on what our self-care um, procedures are. But also the essence of this practice is releasing restlessness. So when you are trying to settle body, speech, and mind, and you are noticing that there is restlessness, well, that's part of the practice, beautiful. You came across the very challenge of this practice, and that is releasing all types of energies in our body and mind that are not in complete alignment and are not completely harmonized. And the natural state is oh, having all those energies to be uh, completely harmonious. So just continuously releasing, releasing, and releasing greater and greater levels of restlessness. And of course, using tricks such as keeping our awareness lower in the body towards our feet as opposed to towards our head and so forth. And uh, paying greater attention to the out breath. All those things will eventually help and eventually take us through that restlessness. But it's also hard to expect that that will happen in just one sit. And that is why we are talking about cultivating the qualities of relaxation, stability, and clarity, which are the quintessential qualities in this practice, over months and years. And as Eve explained last time, this has a lot to do with our subtle body and uh, our, the habits of our nervous system, which is an easier way to explain it. And so we're changing those habits by releasing greater and greater levels of restlessness. Yeah, yeah. So that, that can be one trick. There are other tricks, of course, if you uh, have greater restlessness when you're sitting up, then you can try practicing in the supine position. But if we're talking about restlessness that comes from uh, something major happening in your life, 
just lying down will not do it. You know, it's not just about that. There's maybe like a big thing happening to your children or your parents or something like that. But then the essence is just, I will give myself that rest in this moment. I will temporarily let it all go because the more I am able to tap into my basic goodness, the better I'm able to show up for others. So I would say that. Uh, another comment here in the chat, and also please feel free to raise your hand if you want to say something out loud, um, share something with the group. I find, but I'm going to read this one out. I find it really hard to meditate uh, when I'm tired physically and slept. It's why I'm in that kind of state that I'm more vulnerable to being swayed by others. Do you have any thoughts about how to handle tiredness and unfocusedness? Uh, definitely a very familiar problem for me. When I'm physically tired and uh, like physically tired after, in some cases, many hours of travel, uh, not so much a problem in the pandemic, perhaps, but it used to be a bigger thing uh, where I would sometimes be flying with, between places and I would be in an airport and I'd be like, I don't remember where I'm going and where I'm coming from. You know, it's just like that very hazy state, which can also happen at home or anywhere, really, if we're underslept. Uh, we're vulnerable to our afflictions, to our own mental, negative mental habits in that state, and we're vulnerable to the influence of others. So then having a safety system in place is helpful. If we are severely underslept, not going out with our friends, perhaps, you know, so that we can be affected or not watching TV, maybe, or something that will trigger our afflictions to a greater degree. But also uh, from within saying, hey, well, if I'm that tired, it's best that I sleep now or do some kind of simple type of practice and then go to sleep. Then if I try to engage in an activity that once again has proven in the past to be very provocative for my afflictions that proved to be provoking my afflictions, my negative habits, my addiction energy and so forth. So we have to think about those safety systems in advance before we face those situations. So we look at our past, we see what triggered us in the past, and then we think about these safety procedures. And in some cases, if we're arranging them with our friends, of course, because if we have supportive friends and supportive communities, they would know, hey, well, when Lobson is this level of tired, it's best that we tuck him into bed and make sure everybody leaves him alone because he needs to sleep. Then we allow him to interact with people to the point where he loses his temper and they're like, it's a big thing, you know? So depending on what's available to you, set those safety systems in place. Yes, and do simpler practices rather than more complicated practices until you're rested enough. Yeah, yeah and the, the, the name of the book is Be the Refuge, Raising the Voices of Asian American Buddhists by Cheng Sing Han. Um, I'm, I'm mentioning that because I'm reading the book myself. Uh, Cheng Sing Han is from the Bay Area and uh, her and I will be engaged in a discussion um, in a conference, Zen conference organized by one of the major temples in the Kamakura area in September. So I'm very much looking forward to that. But for those of you interested in sort of decolonizing the history of Buddhism in the United States, where for many years it was presented as uh, sort of all these only exclusively white practitioners and white teachers, you know, bringing the light of mindfulness to the world and let it die, you, you know the thing. So it's very much a first step in counteracting that and looking at the incredible heritage of all the Asian American Buddhist communities and the incredible contribution and their incredibly vibrant spiritual life that is still there, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's very much a very large part of American Buddhism period. So a wonderful book to explore, yeah. Yeah, Noam? Um, thank you so much. Love Seng Teng Pa for today's teaching. It was really interesting and uh, moving. Um, and the what you've said about the four abodes as sort of a, a, a applied when you're noticing uh, the the three you know the three responses you know oh I don't like this or I do like this or it's neutral um, or you know. That seems like so obvious, but I don't think I'd quite ever heard it said that way. So I really appreciate it. But you didn't mention Upeksha, and I wonder sort of what you would say about that. Uh, it's actually interesting because um, Upeksha is sometimes compared to the earth element um, and the three other uh, Viharas or the three other 
types of kindness are compared to the other elements, respectively. That's a connection we only find in the Tibetan tradition, actually. But if we think of equanimity as the earth, it makes a lot of sense that it would be the foundation for all the other balanced responses. So unless we have equanimity, we can't really have balanced loving kindness, balanced compassion, balanced uh, empathetic joy, because um, let alone equanimity for sentient beings, and seeing them all as equally deserving of our love and so forth. On a more foundation level, we need equanimity with regards to situations, with regards to everything that we're facing. And equanimity uh, in that regard is defined as a response or a mental state or an attitude that is equally free from neurotic desire, neurotic aversion, and neurotic indifference, you know, or um, ignorant indifference. So we're equally not over-exaggerating objects and thus, oh, my precious. We're equally not exaggerating the negative sides of object and therefore, oh no, this whole has to be destroyed, you know? And then equally also not being just ignorantly indifferent. We are still engaged with everything that arises, but it all arises to us as in the highest levels of Tibetan Buddhist practice as the beautiful displays of the Buddha mind itself which is of course also a theme in uh, the Chan and Zen tradition. So sort of moving from our very reactive mind towards an equanimous mind, and then eventually a mind that is not simply equanimous, but is also fully awake. That's sort of the general direction there. And the more we are able to cultivate equanimity both towards beings and towards experiences, the greater, the more balanced our loving kindness, compassion and empathetic joy uh, would be. But that type of equanimity, because equanimity is the one immeasurable that also needs, requires a lot of wisdom and really draws from all the wisdom that we've been able to cultivate when thinking about impermanence and selflessness and so forth. Uh, equanimity is a bit technically more challenging than loving kindness, where it's like, oh, may I be happy, may you be happy, may everybody be happy, sort of more straightforward technically, but definitely more foundational as a support for uh, the rest of them. And so sometimes I say that this is a prayer to myself. Uh, on the foundation of equanimity, may I be able to respond to all neutral situations with loving kindness, to all uh, moments of suffering with compassion, to all moments of happiness with empathetic joy. And to sort of remind myself through like a mindfulness verse or a gata like that, that those should be my responses and equanimity is the foundation underneath all of them. Equanimity is like the earth that can bear it all. You know? Well, I think that's it with the questions, at least in with regards to the chat and I don't see any other raised hands. So um, unless something urgent pops up and you're always welcome to contact me through all the other ways. Uh, I think it's a wonderful time to conclude and make sure everybody also enjoys their evening. So just for a moment, let's think about all the positive potential that we've created today in our mind, in our practice, uh, in our meditation and contemplation, and just dedicate it all mentally to our own highest aspirations, not just for our practice, but also for the planet as a whole, because it obviously desperately needs our help and our support, protection, care, uh, just like all the other beings in this world, including beings that surround us on the streets every day. So may they all be well, may they all be free from suffering, maybe they never be separated from blissful joy. And may we continue our practice of mind training until our mind is fully awake for the benefit of all. Thank you.